vivid, um, very strange for me, but uh, uh, something COVID related, I've, I've never done so much biking uh, around town. I don't make long trips out, out of town too far, but just uh, biking around town, just uh, seeing what town is like. And I've had the opportunity to do that a lot more in the last little bit. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Allison. Hello, I'm Allison Townrow. I'm an EA at Cedars Christian School in the high school. Um, this is my first year doing, um, doing this. I work part-time, <clears throat> supposedly Thursdays and Fridays. Um, so the, the, I'm, I missed the questions because I couldn't get in. What's COVID related? Is that the next one? Oh, I just, sorry, yes, Allison. Um, the questions are just say hi, your name, where you teach, and then something COVID related that's just trivia about your life your life in COVID. Okay, yes. So COVID related, um, I live alone and I haven't been able to, of course, meet with my grandchildren. Uh, um, so Monday, I decided that I wanted something else alive in the house, so I bought a fish. <laughs> and then it died on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday I got another one and it seems to be doing better. So yeah, but that was rather ironic. <laughs> that is good to see you're laughing about it. Oh yeah. And now after Rod Wilson's introduction, you could posthumously name the one Simon and you can name this one Garfunkel if you want. Possibly, yes. <laughs> Very good. Anyway, uh, welcome to you guys. Uh, I'm Jonathan Boone, even though my name there says Bulkley Valley Christian School. Uh, I'm using our school's account so that I don't uh, time out after 40 minutes. For those of you that have been using a Zoom platform uh, to live and teach and function in the last number of weeks. Uh, you're probably aware that the learning curve has been, or I'm guessing your learning curve has been steep uh, using that platform as it has been for me. And I can only echo Rod's lament. I wish I had somehow bought into Zoom uh, a year ago, but that's the story of my financial life. <laughs> anyway, there's more to life than just that, obviously. Um, I want to welcome you uh, to this um, workshop of sorts. If you are, I'm just going to throw this out there because I throw this out to my students as well. Um, if you are not comfortable with seeing yourself in a gallery and you like you desperately want to turn the video off or post a picture, I'm totally okay with that. I will not take it personally. Um, I'd rather have you listen uh, and absorb and take this in and learn from it and not be self-conscious or distracted or whatever. So there's an invitation for you. Um, do with it as you please. I will be going to a shared screen view in a few minutes and then we can all kind of hide behind my PowerPoint, uh, myself included. I've lived and worked here in Smithers for upwards of 20 years. Uh, without going into all the detail, um, Karen and I, my wife, we got married about 25 years ago. Uh, we were restless. We were both born outside of the lower mainland in other provinces, but were raised in Langley. And uh, we both went to Trinity Western University and had all kinds of dreams and visions of what life would be like. And in God's good timing and in his grace, um, he decided that I should become a teacher. I actually didn't plan on it. We even moved up here to the north for the sake of location, not vocation. And again, in his goodness, um, God has brought me to this place in my life. And my wife has found her footing uh, in a different but related world. And we both feel like we're flourishing and enjoying life here. One of the things that did bring us to the north, kind of, I want to say ironically, but it's not really the right word. Providentially is probably better is that we were very involved in um, a local kids camp that reached out to First Nations kids. While we were still students at Trinity Western, we had stumbled into this camp through word of mouth um, and uh, got involved in it, worked there for a few summers um, for starvation wages. And then um, when we both graduated and thought, like, where do we want to live? And the lower mainland just wasn't keeping us there, so to speak. Uh, we picked the Bulkley Valley and um, felt a real sense of God's call and purpose in doing so, but would not have foreseen that I would end up as a classroom teacher um, 
in this capacity. And so it's been a huge blessing uh, along the way that interest in First Nations culture, people, and um, way of being has never left me and has actually sharpened me a lot and been a passion of mine. If you know me from crossing paths in Northern BC in our conventions, or um, if you've read the bio that I gave to Edgar and Ellen, uh, sorry, Ella, incorporating First Nations um, ways of being and culture and uh, people into the life of my classroom, the life of my school, and the broader Christian school network that we're all a part of um, has definitely been something that I'm excited about. So um, I'm guessing you are as well to a degree. That's why you've signed up for this um, workshop. Um, I'm hoping, and I don't want to know it, um, that it's because the other links didn't work and you're here by default. <laughs> so don't tell me that if that's the case. I want to I want to live in my delusion at least for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So what I envision is that um, I'll go through a PowerPoint presentation that I have um, and then I'll link from there into a document that's um, being made for SCSBC by myself with um, to some degree, Michelle Niederloff of Duncan Christian School. You might know her. Uh, she's a longtime Christian educator in that community and a wonderful woman. Uh, her and I were kind of co-creating it. Um, I kind of had the lead on it. It's one of the hats I wear as a learning associate for SESBC. And then COVID hit just at the time that we were trying to wrap this whole thing up and get it um, to print, so to speak, so that it could be more of a PDF type of a document to have for this convention, but you guys probably all realize um, everything that was normal is um, on the side or on the back burner, including projects like this, um, as we've all tried to adapt what we do um, to this new reality. And so Michelle kind of had to like step out of that role because she wears the vice principal hat at Duncan. So you're looking at a, you will be looking at a work in progress and um, it'll be, um, You'll be able to see it and I'll walk you through it. And uh, if you, you know, it'll take about 30, I'll take about 40 minutes to do so. My goal is, because we're a small group, that if you have a question or a comment outside of when I pause and say, hey, do you have any questions or comments, that you simply unmute and just speak and um, you know how it works. I'll know that you're trying to get a hold of me um, and then we'll kind of stop and go from there. So, Assuming that there aren't any questions or comments right now, I will try to share screen. And now I realize I'm, oh, there we go. I was kind of frozen. Okay, so I'm just gonna share the screen here. And if somebody can give me a thumbs up that you're seeing my screen, that'd be great. Awesome. And I'll just go to slide presentation. Okay, so I'll just kind of um, talk my way through these slides and um, have you listen. Yeah, I should note and let you know that this is being recorded at um, Terrace's request so that they can put this on their platform or pass it off to SES or CBC for um, access by others. Don't let that intimidate you if you have a question. Um, that's just the way it is. So I'm hoping that if you're like me, you've kind of been living in the trenches of, you know, the quarantine um, and it's kind of like, I'm using the language of trenches because it feels a little bit like a siege or a military, or it has been, at least two weeks ago for me, it sure did. I feel like I'm getting my groove a little bit, but the goal here with this particular workshop and what I like about this particular day um, is that we're kind of like zooming up and zooming out, um, out of the trenches and taking a bit of a broader perspective on uh, important things philosophically and very practically. And so I'm just enjoying the distraction, if nothing else, the opportunity to kind of like not think about being under quarantine and COVID, even though we're still, of course, using this Zoom platform. I love the subtitle that Terrace came up with for this day, inviting them into a better story. Um, Rod has spoken to that already, you know, reminded us of the biblical story that we're a part of, and I love his emphasis on flourishing. Um, it's not new, I think, for that, that concept is not new to most of us being, you know, Christian educators, but 
again, the benefit of this type of a setting and this type of a day and the kind of speaker that Rod is, is that we're reminded again that we do belong to a better story where God intends for there to be flourishing. And so that's very appropriate in my mind to this particular workshop, which is about reconciliation. Um, it's a recognition that the effects of the fall are very real in our world, uh, in between uh, these two cultures, what I'm just going to call the dominant culture that I'm a part of and you are a part of and our schools are a part of and the less dominant, historically marginalized and suppressed culture of the first peoples um, of Canada BC and Northern BC for us in particular. So um, as Northern schools, you're kind of getting a sneak peek. This is the first time that this document will be uh, shared in this capacity. And we wanted, Darren and I in the planning for this wanted to be intentional about that because um, with the exception of Duncan Christian School um, in the Cowichan Valley, when you look at all of our schools, it's the Northern schools where the single largest minority group is indigenous people. Now, it's hard to actually get real stats on that. I tried through Stats Canada, I tried through Wikipedia, I tried through you know, um, each of our own city's websites that they put up and the numbers vary, but it's very safe to say that no matter whether you are living in Terrace, um, Smithers, Houston, uh, Vanderhoof or Prince George, at minimum, indigenous people make up 12 to 15% of um, the population. And in each of our communities, they are the single largest recognizable minority. And then after that, it sprinkles down to various groups at anywhere from five to you know, 1%. So in other words, where we live, indigenous people are visibly present. Uh, you know that about the community you live in, and I know that about mine. Um, there's been a trend, obviously, across Canada for the last generation. Um, First Nations people are generally um, statistically moving off of reserve and into our very communities because they seek the same things that you and I seek. Uh, education, employment, better health care, um, sometimes escape and the need to just put distance between themselves and their home communities. Um, and really, it's about opportunity. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily succeeding as they move into our communities, but nor does it mean that they're failing. Um, it laments me that as Christian schools across BC, we're not necessarily doing a good job of enfolding them into our schools. And so that's kind of why we don't see, for the most part, there are exceptions, for the most part, we don't see Indigenous representation in our classrooms to the same degree that they are a visible minority in our communities. So we should be seeing upwards of, well, depending again on where you live, but 15 to 20 to 25 percent of Indigenous kids, um, of our student population, sorry, being of Indigenous background. And by rights, we should be seeing it in our, um, on our committees and on our boards and in our staff rooms and classroom as leaders as well. And that's simply not there yet. I am, like you, a person of hope and believe that as we help to create and be used by God to write a better story where there's flourishing, we will see that change take place in due time. Um, I'm thankful that Edgar um, gave a territory acknowledgement. And so I can't speak for the communities that you're listening from. But in this area, in the Balkley Valley, we live and move and have our being on unceded traditional territories of the Wet'suwet'en. I'm just slide advancing here. I've got an image here of a path because, or maybe a road, um, because I've titled this document Pathways, plural, intentionally, um, to reconciliation because so often in education, um, we stumble into documents and resources that are labeled strategies or keys or something to that effect. Um, I don't want to get tied up on semantics and word choice, but when it comes to relationship based um, things like reconciliation, I really do like the image of a path. Um, I'm being intentional there to stress in a very postmodern way the concept of being on a journey. Um, there is an end goal in mind, and that is 
reconciliation and flourishing. But the idea of a path um, is that we're walking. And in this image that I've tried to pick, it's one path, but you can kind of see there's two lanes where I guess traffic has beaten the road down. The idea is partnership, um, that we are walking with our indigenous brothers and sisters down the path of reconciliation towards flourishing. Um, and strategies and keys to me um, aren't just other words. They have ideas behind them that kind of perhaps might give us the impression of a guaranteed outcome. And here's the tricky part. When you're talking about relationship, there's not always guarantees. And because to echo Rod, we live in a fallen world where things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Um, when it comes to relationships, especially ones where there's massive historical power imbalance, there really is no guarantee that we will have the success that we're looking for in the same way that a strategy might um, give us that impression. The strategy, of course, implies that if you just do A, B, and C, you'll get you know, D, E, and F as a des desired outcome. The idea too, of course, is that if you're on a pathway and you fall off uh, with a partner or you go astray, the other person can reach out their hand and help you and get you back on the road, on the path, so to speak. And the idea here is, of course, that this is for mutual blessing. Um, if there's any um, overtones of colonialism or paternalism in this presentation, they are 100% unintentional. I'm not talking about us leading the way as the dominant culture. I'm talking about walking with um, in partnership, even if you want to use the language of hand in hand, side by side. So the term reconciliation obviously was a bit of a buzzword in our country back in 2017 when we were celebrating our 150th anniversary as a country um, on the heels of, sorry, just prior to that was of course um, the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that Murray Sinclair chaired, which was an investigation into the residential school experience. And so that document, that report was issued in full uh, near the end of 2015, I believe. And so a short two years later, here we were as a country celebrating our birthday and the two kind of collided. And you will recall that there was lots of talk about what kind of a country have we built anyway and what kind of a future do we want for ourselves? Um, so the term reconciliation, I kind of noted uh, in my own journey back at that time, never really got defined. Um, we hear a lot of it and it means different things to different people. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that the very act of walking on that path, um, hand in hand, side by side with Indigenous partners, is itself an act of reconciliation. But you don't stay on the path um, in one spot. You continually move forward towards that flourishing and that better story that we desire for them and for us together. Um, when we can have in our Christian schools um, an openness to um, their way of being and recognize that they bring with them gifts that we would be blessed by in ways of understanding truth and scripture and God in our place in this world that would benefit us as well. Now, to not be totally um, postmodern or relativist, I do want to use this um, as a term or a definition that I'm stealing from that Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's short, uh, it's easy to get your head around, and it's not prescriptive. Um, it means that we work to establish and maintain respectful relationships. The key word, of course, to me being relationships, um, respectful ones. We were and have been in relationship to Indigenous people throughout our country's history, but it's been more than top-down and oppressive, and it's resulted in all kinds of socioeconomic and um, damage, uh, marginalization, and you know that history. We don't need to dwell on it. But this is about a new way forward. And the term pathways is plural because there isn't a one size fits all. Um, relationships look different in different places and at different times. And so um, there isn't one path that gets us to and helps us journey towards reconciliation. Um, every community and every person has to kind of develop that path for themselves. The tools that I'll be showing you or the resources I'll be showing you in a minute are part of that journey process. 
I've referenced Murray Sinclair already. His name might be familiar to you outside of this presentation. He was the chair, he's now a senator, but he was the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, spent five years crisscrossing this country, listening to survivors' testimonies and experiences in residential schools. And he, along with his co-commissioners, um, wrote the massive document that's now that report. So while that report focuses exclusively or originally on residential schools, we can use it as a starting point for our experiences to talk about all things relationally to Indigenous people. He's got two lines in that massive document that um, I've pulled for us to consider. Uh, he said this, or he wrote this, education is what got us into this mess, the mess of the broken relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people through the residential school um, experiment. And then he writes, education is, will, is what will get us out. Secondly, he said this, education holds the key to reconciliation. It's where our country will heal itself. So no doubt you recognize some secular and humanistic overtones, probably. Uh, he's not writing as a Christian, but by God's grace, we can recognize um, the references or the recognition of being made in the image of God uh, when we talk about reconciliation. Um, I ask you to be generous with these comments. Um, we can apply them to our own context, our own classrooms, our own schools. And uh, we recognize as educators, of course, that it is a very powerful tool. And so hence the need for Christian education that points us to the creator God who made us in his image and um, points us back to the flourishing that he desired. Um, and I do believe that not just indigenous communities will flourish, but all of us will flourish when we do a better job of enfolding and in, uh, in carrying them into our schools and our way of being. You're maybe familiar with that report. Uh, there are 94 calls to action. A number of them are directed um, specifically at educators at the post-secondary and the day school level. Um, I don't have them here in detail for you, but interestingly in that entire report, in, within those 94 calls to action, 40 times the word educate or education is used um, edu from educating um, law enforcement officers to educating the criminal justice system and again to educating people that train our schools, uh, teachers that is, to people that run our schools, to teachers themselves. So again, education is powerful. Uh, call number 62 applies directly to us as educators. Uh, I'll read it for you. Uh, the commissioners said this, we call upon the federal, provincial, and territorial governments in consultation and collaboration with survivors, Aboriginal peoples, and educators, which is us, to do this, to make age-appropriate curriculum on residential schools, treaties, and Aboriginal peoples' historical and contemporary contributions to Canada, a mandatory education requirement for kindergarten to grade 12 students. Call to, call to action number 63 says this, we call upon the Council of Ministers of Education uh, and we call upon Canada to maintain an annual commitment to average, Aboriginal education issues, including developing and implementing K through 12 curriculum and learning resources on Aboriginal peoples in Canadian history and the history and legacy of residential schools to share that information and best practices on teaching curriculum related to residential schools and Aboriginal history, and to build student capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect. And when I think of our role as educators in Christian day schools, um, this is a huge part of what has defined my life uh, as a teacher, trying to get non-Indigenous students um, to build their capacity for empathy and respect for but has historically been the other. And as hopefully more and more indigenous communities and peoples um, take their place, their rightful place within our schools, not just in the classroom, but in our staff rooms and on our boards and in our committees, that intercultural understanding, empathy and mutual respect will only grow. I wanna draw your attention uh, to Micah 6 verse 8, words that are probably very familiar to you uh, to say this, regardless of the TRC and the new redesigned curriculum that we're all familiar with now for a few years in BC, which rightfully has a heavy emphasis upon Aboriginal 
um, perspectives and ways of being, regardless of all that, and I'm thankful for it, our mandate as educators comes from God himself. Um, and Micah 6, 8 says just this, we are required to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. So justice is being called or set up here as an action, something that we do, not just something that we talk about or hope for, but actually live out. We're called to love mercy. Love is obviously um, a fruit of the spirit. It's also a disposition. And for us as members of the dominant culture, we have to make sure that we rid of our love, any paternalistic or colonial overtones that keeps Aboriginal people as separate from or as the other. Um, the use of the word walk appeals to me, again, um, in relation to the pathway metaphor. Um, the idea of humble or humbly with God implies uh, that we should withhold judgment and the right to voice an opinion or to judge a culture or a way of life that's different than ours before first becoming aware of the people who hold to that culture and live it out. So I'm guessing here that as um, you're listening, I'm preaching to the choir. I don't know how to avoid that, but I wanted to spend a few minutes going over foundational things before jumping into the document itself and showing you some of those resources as a way to hopefully encourage you and to anchor you um, much in the same way that Rod Wilson has anchored me again um, in the understanding of Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 as God's creational design and the flourishing that he desires in a world that has um, turned against him and forgotten about him and defined for ourselves what is good and right and true. So, but this raises a question, maybe that's why you're here, um, how then shall we teach as Christian educators who are concerned and passionate about um, doing our jobs well to the glory of God and particularly in a way that bridges the gap um, or whatever metaphor you want to use opens up our rooms and our schools towards more and greater Aboriginal inclusion. And that's where this document hopefully will provide some um, structure for you. Um, I just want to use one more image uh, before we jump into that document. Again, paths. Um, I'm trying to get the impression here, it didn't really work with this image, that where we face um, a fork in the road on that path, that pathway to reconciliation, if one of those paths, one of those ways of reconciling and being in a spirit and state of reconciliation and partnership is wide and looks easy um, and seems to say, come this way, this will be straightforward, implement this and check it off, whether that's a ministry guideline or um, something from within our own schools, or some resource we stumble into, I would advise you be careful of it. Um, the narrow path is the hard path um, of hard work. If reconciliation and the act of partnering and holding hands and walking side by side with indigenous peoples doesn't demand something of us, doesn't unsettle us and cause us to question our own assumptions and ways of being, uh, we're probably not walking that narrow path we're walking the broad and wide path, which may get us there in the end by God's grace, but might also trip us up. So because there is incredible historical injustice and so much pain and so much trauma because of actions that our government, our church, our culture, and our schools have perpetuated um, on Aboriginal peoples and have marginalized them, we need to be very careful very aware and very humble as we proceed. And so the process itself actually matters. In other words, don't run along the path, walk along the path and perhaps walk along the path at the pace that your indigenous brothers and sisters want to walk rather than trying to set the pace and tone for yourself. Um, I have a prayer here that I'm not going to pray for you, but just share with you that I came across um, a while ago. It's from the Franciscan monk order. I don't know the background beyond it, uh, of it beyond that, but it goes like this. May God bless us as Christian educators with discomfort at easy answers 
half-truths and superficial relationships so that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression and exploitation so that we may work for justice, freedom and peace as Christian educators. And may God bless us again as educators with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, hunger and war so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And finally, may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others perhaps claim cannot be done, which is to bring justice and kindness to all. And to echo Rod Wilson and what he mentioned this morning so that we all may flourish and the creation itself and all of us may experience that shalom that God desires. I'm going to click on this link and if I set this up right, it should take me to that document. So please be patient if not. Jonathan, while you're uploading that, can I just make a comment? Yes, actually, I have in my notes here to pause and to ask if anybody has any comments, takeaways, or feedback. <laughs> Go ahead, Tricia. Um, thank you. I really appreciate the, the Christian perspective on reconciliation. And um, all of us who are certified teachers, I know not all of us are certified, but um, the standards on which we hold our certification are um, put forward by the BC Teachers Council. And up until last year, there were eight standards that allow us to be educators and are used as a measure, uh, a measuring tool for us to maintain our certification. And if we breach or break them, then these are the standards by which we can also be disciplined in different ways. So last year, the BC Teachers Council, I'm sure all of you know, they added a standard number nine. And standard number nine reads that educators critically examine their own biases, attitudes, beliefs, values, and practices to facilitate change. Educators value and respect the languages, heritage, heritages, cultures, and ways of knowing and being of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Educators understand the power of focusing on connectedness and relationships to oneself, family, community, and the natural world. Educators integrate First Nations, Inuit, and Métis worldviews and perspectives into learning environments. So not only is it something that we should do as Christian educators and our understanding of flourishing for all and love of God's creation for all peoples, um, it's something that we have to do to maintain our teaching certification and to be teachers, whether it's in independent or public schools. So I just, that was the extended version of standard nine, but um, just wanted to remind you that it is our duty also to, um, to be um, understanding and promoting the history and perspectives of uh, First Nations ways of being and knowing. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Tricia. Appreciate that. It's, um, it's more than a moral duty. It's now also, you could say, a contractual duty as well. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments from anybody else? Um, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at the shared screen with you. Um, so if, um, if not, I will walk us through this work in progress. Um, what you're looking at here is within the SCSBC portal that's not available to everybody yet because again, we haven't so-called released it. One thing I haven't mentioned, um, but both Michelle and Duncan and myself here in Smithers, we've given this document in, uh, into the hands, we've, given, we've put this document together and now put it into the hands of trusted First Nations um, partners, that friends that we have in this various areas. So I've given it to two ladies um, in this community. Um, and uh, they're vetting it for me. And um, Michelle's also putting it in the hands of several people, indigenous friends, educators that she has in her circle down in Duncan, and they're vetting it as well. Um, and that's, you know, our hope with that is to kind of put their stamp of approval, recognizing that of course, uh, they don't speak for all First Nations people or necessarily even their communities but we wanted to have that important lens and that feedback. I've received some feedback from uh, one lady already. It's been very helpful. 
And it's amazing how despite my best efforts to be sensitive and careful and non-colonial and all those other things, it still came across in some places. And so I had to change some wording and, and such. So you really are getting a sneak peek at a work in progress. Um, and so uh, I'll just scroll down here. I won't spend time on the rationale because that's effectively what I've just done uh, in that presentation that I've given you. But what you're looking at here, uh, going down the left-hand column, are about, I think we have 18. It's changing all the time as we modify this and get that feedback. But I think presently there are 18 recommendations that we are putting forward that individual teachers within our Christian schools could implement or leaders themselves um, could work towards implementing school-wide. Even though there's significant overlap between rationale and result, um, we've tried to separate them. And so as you look at this, you might find yourself thinking what well, looks more like a result than a rationale. Um, but uh, um, just do with that as you please. And, and again, just be gracious. And on the far right-hand column are some live links towards resources um, that you can use to shape and implement this. It's amazing how fast. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, I'm just seeing a title. Have you clicked on it yet? I have. Okay, I'm, I'm only seeing, seeing I'm not seeing pathways. anything. Yeah, okay. I just see the title as well. I just oh, no. sent that to Jonathan, but. Okay. Oh, I see now my chat is going off. Are you guys <laughs> saying you're not looking at the shared document? It's right. just the title. A title, what's the title you're looking so at? It's, it's in yellow, it's underlined, and it says SCSBC Pathways to Reconciliation. Oh, okay, let and me. All I see is my icon. Okay, let me stop sharing um, and let me close the PowerPoint. I wonder if that's interfering. Okay, now I'm gonna to try to share screen again. There it okay. is. Are you looking at it now? Yes, rationale. Okay, all right, sorry about that. Thank you for voicing that and sorry I didn't see the chat. When you're in share screen, the chat function kind of disappears to the top right. Um, so I didn't see that. Okay, so if you're looking at the document now, uh, what I was gonna say was, this is the rationale. I'm not gonna spend any time on that because I already have. Here is the document itself. Um, it's in chart four. I'll state what I already did. This column here is the 18-ish recommendations that we've come up with for both or Day, uh, sorry, classroom educators or school leaders. This is the rationale for this particular recommendation. And this is the intended result in the third column. The fourth column are the links. Um, and we've already had to change the links because the nature of the internet is such that some links already went dead um, in the two or three months that I've been working on this. So again, um, I'm not sure how we're gonna publish it when the time comes, but we'll deal with that later. So what I'll do here is just kind of walk you through these. I won't read everything because that's a little tedious. Um, we're down to about the last 15 minutes here, but um, I'll, I'll read this column and highlight a few things here uh, in the rationale and result and kind of flesh them out a little bit and would love your feedback if you have it. So these are not in any particular order. When this document is finalized, we might try to put them in a particular order um, but at this point, they're just literally, as we came up with them, edited them and moved them around. So one thing that we're definitely calling on schools to do is to implement the Truth and Reconciliation's calls to action. Um, again, within the 94 calls to action, uh, two of them are directly related. I read them to you, to day schools. Um, but there are others that talk more about a disposition and steps, et cetera. So, um, it's a way of saying we take responsibility for these recommendations um, as Christian schools to work towards a more flourishing way of being. Um, very practically, we're calling on schools to learn about residential schools. It's obviously now saturated the new curriculum. Um, and so we're not trying to like um, double up on that so much as really what we're saying is own the learning and teaching about residential schools and don't reduce it to a mere curriculum checkbox um, where you now you pull out the, the token kit at the grade four or six or 10 level and say, okay, for the next three days, this is what we're doing. Here's your lesson plan, some worksheets, and let's move on. Um, but rather, 
to stress what's in this McLean's article, which I think is still live. Um, there's basically a humanist kind of plea to own this as a way of honoring the survivors and for us to own the legacy of residential schools, even though, as we're all aware, they've closed. Um, the last one closed over 20 years ago. And uh, a lot of people, you know, get a knee jerk reaction and say, it wasn't me that sent them. Um, this article and this recommendation are about owning the legacy. We may not have sent or supported or built residential schools, but we drink downriver from them as members of the dominant culture. It's one of those tools that was very effective in marginalizing First Nations people so that we could get access to the land and the resources. And so we may not have um, created them, we might try to distance, distance ourselves from them, but my experience has been Indigenous people associate Christian day schools and Christians with that horrible legacy. And so we kind of have to own that and use it, um, use it as an opportunity to move forward. Switching gears here, but still related to residential schools, we highly recommend schools take part in Orange Shirt Day. That's a growing new phenomenon that started out of Williams Lake with um, Ruby um, Wedstad, I think her name is. I mean, I'll be saying that right. You're probably familiar with her. Some of your schools are maybe already moving towards taking part in res uh, Orange Shirt Day. It sends a very positive message that this matters, much like some of our schools um, or hopefully all of our schools now take part in some form of anti-bullying pink shirt day. I know that when that emerged seven or eight years ago, there was some resistance about it and what message were we sending? Uh, the reality is if you don't take part in it, you look bad in the eyes of the culture and that sends a message that you don't intend no matter how much you try to explain your rationale. So we highly recommend schools take part in Orange Shirt Day. Um, as already noted, and pleased to hear Edgar did a land acknowledgement um, I can't remember why these are lumped together, but um, I'm not going to get fussy about that. This is a work in progress. A land acknowledgement tells the original inhabitants and reminds the rest of us that we do live on land that was not taken through war, not treated away, wasn't bought, and wasn't sold. It just kind of happened. And so it's part of developing a common understanding of the area that predates colonization. Somehow, the original inhabitants were moved aside, shoved aside through forces larger and more powerful than, than themselves. And we just kind of took over. And the message we send to the original community um, and the original people is when we do a land acknowledgement and develop a common understanding is we share in their history. And we say to ourselves and to them, we recognize things happened that shouldn't have. We maybe can't undo those things, but we recognize that we benefit from them. And so for that and with you, we want to walk forward towards a better day. We highly recommend that schools incorporate the First Peoples principles of learning. I know that there's a few in there that kind of scare Christian educators. We ask that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, um, but you take time through this link in particular uh, to become familiar with them. They are more than anything a way of pedagogy. Um, then they are content. And um, I think they're just good educational practice. All learners benefit and all teachers improve their practice by incorporating elements of them where they can. We highly recommend that schools adopt local protocols. Um, so if it's normal to have um, a respected Indigenous elder open an event um, for the public, um, as a new way of being in your community that the school also considers having a respected elder open a formal occasion at the school as well. It builds bridges and it demonstrates and finds common ground with First Nations people. Uh, very practically, we highly recommend you display artwork in public spaces within the school and wherever possible that it's actually locally produced. Um, off the top of my head, I think one of the campuses of Surrey Christian School I did this, I was at a workshop there a few years ago where they had a very significant piece of art in the hallway uh, main lobby when you walked in and it spoke volumes to me about their attempts to support a local artist to reach out with and for the local community and to basically say, um, this is normal here and this is something we celebrate and it's part of being a good neighbor. Um, and so again, um, I encourage that. Very practically, invite Indigenous guests into the classroom. 
into your schools and your public gatherings. Um, they are knowledge keepers. They have a way of being and a way of understanding that's different than ours. And so if you're talking about land use in science class or biology, whether you're talking about literature in some English class, whether you're talking history and social studies or law or Bible, um, there are all kinds of indigenous people out there who can bless you and your students and be blessed by being a part of your classroom. I put the term experts in the field in quotes. Um, lots of people don't see themselves as experts. I don't see myself that way. I'm guessing you probably don't either. And lots of indigenous people don't see themselves as experts. So um, I put it in quotes to, to emphasize that they don't actually have to be whatever an expert is supposed to be. They just can speak as themselves, perhaps for their culture, perhaps for themselves and their community and their family. But again, it's a blessing. So we've given some examples here because we don't have a link to the internet for that. Um, almost every community in BC has a friendship center. They have all kinds of people there who know their culture very well and are more than willing to share it. Um, we recommend incorporating the local indigenous language into the life of the school because languages, all First Nations languages in BC are at high risk for disappearing in the next generation. There's incredible efforts being made now by those communities, by education um, fields, schools, to save them and to reteach them. And so the good news is, even though they're at risk of extinction, Stats Canada revealed and lots of surveys reveal that there's more people learning those languages um, and speaking them as a first language than there was a generation ago. So hope is on the horizon. Um, so if we decide to put the word office um, on the front door leading into the main administrative area in English, some schools do that in French to promote our second language. It makes sense to me that we also put it in the language of the local people. Um, and you can obviously do that by going online and um, finding the word, or you could more appropriately form a relationship with a local language speaker and tell them about your rationale and your reasons and bring them into the school and find ways to label those public places from library to classroom to gym to stairwell, et cetera, et cetera. Something that's very um, geographically appropriate to the north here, um, given that we live on the Highway of Tears, but not unique to the north, I highly recommend, we highly recommend all schools find ways age appropriately to learn about the murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. That commission has also wrapped up its report a couple of years ago and has issued it. It's heartbreaking, gut-wrenching stuff, but there are all kinds of people within our communities, especially in the north, that have lost loved ones tragically and their murders remain unsolved or they're still missing. Um, last year I brought in the survivor, uh, a sister of a girl that went missing um, in this area and it went in a way that I could never have imagined. This girl, this lady, this grown woman spoke about the loss of her sister uh, to their family and the devastation that brought to them and in, I kind of had one goal in mind for my students hearing this lady speak but she blew it out of the park um, without any bells and whistles. My 30-ish grade 11 and 12 students sat um, silent uh, and dumbfounded, for lack of a better word, after listening to her speak for about 30 minutes. And when it came to the question and answer time uh, that she had set time aside for, I actually uh, dismissed the kids for five minutes just hello? so. Hello? Oh, hello. This is Tony Nutto. Mm -hmm. Alan Bain here needs to get a MacBook for his daughter. Is there some program somewhere with schools? Or um, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, Sherry, just go on the website and look. Sherry, can just, you mute your yeah. mic? Can somebody yes. mic, mute their That's mic, please? <laughs> okay, I'll just continue. I'm aware that we're down to the last six minutes or so. Anyway, um, this has to be an age appropriate thing, but there's nothing like the power of human story to say this is what happened to me and my sister and my family and our community. And the impact then um, is incredible. I think I was telling you, oh yeah, I had to bring my students back in after five minutes just so that they could kind of like get their heads around uh, the story. And then um, they spent the next, my students spent the next 20 minutes just listening to this lady. It was very uh, powerful. Something a bit broader that would be in the hands of your board or your principal. Um, I highly recommend developing an educators and elders advisory committee. Find a few people, indigenous people in your community that you have a relationship with that you trust. Um, maybe they do or don't have connections to the school and just 
kind of set them up like something of a sub education committee who can vet your resources, provide some training, um, and just kind of be a voice to filter things that you do. Because a lot of us obviously aren't indigenous and we wonder, am I doing this right? Am I proceeding carefully? Am I going to offend anybody? And it's done out of a sense of care um, for sure. But sometimes that can also lead to paralysis because we don't want to proceed and we don't know how to proceed. We don't proceed and an opportunity is lost there. Similar to that, we encourage the use of resources designed and approved by Indigenous authors locally and otherwise, um, just for good reason to remove that colonial voice. Uh, we, we recommend that where possible, you observe the local First Nations seasons. I know at the elementary level, there's a big deal spent on learning what happens in the fall and what happens in the winter and the spring and the summer. And we think in terms of the calendar and the life and the rhythm of the school and birthdays and holidays, but every First Nations community in BC followed a seasonal calendar. Um, they lived somewhere in the fall, they moved somewhere else in the winter, and they harvested something else somewhere else in the spring and summer. Why not find a way to embed that into your curriculum and celebrate that as well? We, rec we recommend um, recognizing and attending local Indigenous events. There would be some broad ones like National Indigenous Day in June. Um, there's red or oh, sorry, orange shirt day, of course, but your local communities will have all kinds of things going on, perhaps a feast for educators, for the community, perhaps special speakers. You have to have your finger on the pulse of your local community, um, but your local band, your local friendship center, and the people that you are connected with. Um, I don't know how to say the word properly, but I know in Terrace, Hawaii is a big deal, um, as it is down in Vancouver. Um, why not just come along and soak up all the goodness that goes with something like that? We recommend that administrators provide trauma-informed um, ways, uh, practices, sorry, to their staff because almost every Indigenous person lives with generation, intergenerational trauma. The stats just bear that out. Um, and so they're in our classrooms and um, they may not be functioning. They may look like um, they're functioning well, but they may not be. And so we need those tools as well. Admin needs to set time aside for professional development. We all have enough on our plates as educators and more is being added all the time, especially in a time of COVID. Um, we all get some three to five days a year for professional development within our school calendars. Why not set aside a day to develop some of these resources and ways of being um, so that we can move on that pathway to reconciliation. Finally, uh, in the last three minutes I have on my clock here, we need to develop shared experiences. So get your kids from your classroom out into the community with local Indigenous kids. Get your teachers out of the classroom and the building and share time and space in Indigenous communities with fellow educators. Attend Pro-D events together or arrange for a Pro-D event and bring them to your school and share together share a meal together. We all know the power of um, positive experiences and relationships. They shape us in ways that words can't and help us to again remember that um, it, this is about us and not about the other. So I'm not gonna drop down here to our learning targets. This is more of a work in progress. I realize that we're down to the last two minutes. I'm just gonna stop sharing the screen so I can look at you again. And I realize maybe that was like drinking from a water, um, O's, not a water fountain. Any questions, comments, or feedback that any of you have that you'd like to throw at us? Oh, and I, I, see, Mar I see Marshall's joined us. Welcome, Marshall. Sorry, go ahead, Jamie. Oh, I just wanted to say um, I'm actually with Suetin, and I'm oh. from the Luxilio clan and belong to the House of Many Eyes. So I am extremely passionate about seeing this in our SESBC and working this into policies. Um, it's definitely in my heart and a deep passion of mine and we've been trying to work through stuff at Cedars and I'm excited about how that's progressing. So super thrilled to see um, all these things. I was writing down all these notes and to see this policy forming and this reconciliation, I think as Christians, um, and I've talked about this at Cedars, we have that responsibility. Christ has reconciled to us and we need to be reconciling with the Indigenous people. Um, in Canada and in the areas and the territories that we live in. So I'm super excited. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. It's a blessing to have you um, share that information with us. Pardon me for not knowing that. Um, so thanks for your positive feedback. I'd 
love to chat with you further later. Um, maybe not today, but um, if we can connect uh, and share email addresses, I'd love to chat more about um, your journey and your experience and get your feedback further as well. So thank you. I do want to be aware of the time, um, but I don't want to cut anybody off either. Uh, any other further questions, comments, feedback for consideration? Jonathan, I was just um, kind of taking some notes and um, when you were showing that table, the, um, the left column was the recommendation and then the far right column was resources. What were the two middle columns? Uh, the first middle column is the rationale. Okay. Where I basically say, this is why I think your school should do this. Okay. And the third column is result, kind of like what, what, what the goal is by embracing that recommendation. Perfect. Do you it's, know how many, how many schools, um, I'm sorry, I'm speaking really quickly here. Yep. <laughs> um, do you know how many schools have a, a kind of um, First Nations support staff or so an Indigenous person on staff who is championing, championing this in the school? How are we doing in that regard? That's a great question. And so in my working document, um, to wrap up this work pre-COVID and now as you know everything has just kind of been slowed right down that's actually one of the things to do so I don't have an answer for you right now um, I will say this there are some school I am aware that some schools um, have been very intentional about having what the public system calls an aboriginal support provider um, not many of our SCSBC schools do like not many at all it, it just hasn't been a priority um, the busyness of running a school budgets. I, I don't want to sound judgmental because um, our school doesn't either, for the record. Um, but I will say this, I think we're a little bit, well, I've, I'll, I'll say this, recognizing that this is recorded and um, we are, our Christian schools, there is some fantastic stuff happening. So I'll qualify it by saying that in your schools, in my school, in your classrooms, maybe by God's grace, my classroom. Um, but as a movement, our schools are one generation behind the public school system. A generation ago, public schools in BC were already talking about this and developing strategies to increase Aboriginal success, graduation success. Um, trying to get, close the gap between graduation levels. Like it's been, poor for Aboriginal students and it's been decent for non-Aboriginal students. So it was driven by that. It's now morphed into this new reality, um, a, a much better reality where First Peoples principles are, are a part of our way of being, the learning standards and the new curriculum. And so we are kind of Johnny come lately as Christian schools, um, unless circumstances have pushed it on us um, by God's grace, like in Duncan. Duncan is ahead of all of our schools, as you are all aware. They've done some fantastic stuff. They have about 30 to 40% of their student body is Aboriginal. It's fantastic. I, I dream of that for our own, all our schools, um, that we would reflect the percentage as mentioned. So that's a long answer. I hope to have that, um, that hope, that dream uh, quantified by the time school season's over this year. Okay, I'm actually, you can't see it, but I'm getting alerts that our time is up. So I'm going to um, close this meeting uh, in prayer by praying for lunch and to remind you that you are asked to, I think Edgar said, go back to the main link and connect uh, before lunch or during lunch so that you can go to your breakout sessions, grade level appropriate after lunch. So I'm not really comfortable praying over Zoom. It's a weird reality for me, but I'm also not comfortable teaching over Zoom and that's become a reality. So uh, let me lead in prayer and then you can quit the meeting um, and I'll follow up on some of those private chats that you guys have sent. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time where we can spend um, sharing um, this desire that we have to be places where flourishing occurs. Thank you for the excellent and timely and wise words of Rod Wilson this morning to remind us of what your intention is for creation. Thank you for um, the reminder that um, we are called into a relationship with you through Jesus in order to flourish and be agents of reconciliation, just as we've been called into a relationship with you 
through Jesus, we are now called to take that and work it out into our relationship with all your people. We pray for your blessing on all of our efforts, well, however small or big they are towards uh, reconciliation, that a new day might dawn where there is better and greater flourishing and um, things can be more like what you intend for us uh, this side of eternity. We pray for your blessing on the lunch that we're about to eat. We ask for strength and fellowship uh, with whoever we can. We'd be honoring and glorifying to you and for a blessing on this afternoon sessions as well. We commit ourselves into your care now and ask again for um, the way that we are and who we are and how we speak to reflect who you are and how you've called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. Hey, yeah, thank you, you guys. Um, sorry for talking so much. In my planning, I thought 45 minutes of me yakking and 15 minutes of Q&A and comments, but big surprise, that didn't happen. <laughs> so anyway, blessings to you guys. Thanks for your uh, feedback thanks, and your Jonathan. input and for attending. We'll see you sometime this afternoon. Thank you.